Good evening, this is Anagalactic bringing you another science broadcast in a series on infinity where we have just reached some rather dramatic conclusions. In science, what we like in terms of drama is simplicity. If something is simplified so that it's easier to understand, then the first thing we do is ask you for a proof. <laughs> because because it's too good to be true. We have to be sure in science. Spherical geometry is a strange topic to bring up. I am dealing in spherical geometry in these lectures, but it is remarkable that this spherical geometry addresses so many paradoxes so well. All I did in telling you the correct definition of infinity so that you can figure it out for yourself if you can. You would be the first, by the way. But it would help to be able to even talk about it. It turns out it's a morphological principle that the better you are at stating what the problem is, the more likely you are to figure out the answer. You may actually say the answer while trying to describe the problem. That has been known to happen. The discovery of a new geometry is uh, a story that you can read about uh, from the 1800s, what we commonly call the 19th century. I am dealing in geometry, but it is interesting to realize that geometry is always, always linear geometry. An interesting thing to be able to say. That's very simple to say that. That all geometries we've ever had are linear geometries. For a very simple reason, which is also worth saying since it was proved in my lifetime, although I had somewhat of a secondary hand in getting what you might call a, a corollary. If you know what the line is, you first of all know it's a geometrical object. It helps to be able to say why, but we all accept that, and it turns out it's fairly clear if there were such a thing as a proof for what I'm about to say, we already have it. I'm not sure this can be fully proved, but it looks almost exactly if not exactly as if we were blueprinted to see a straight line. It certainly appears that we've always known what the straight line is. But it's a remarkable fact that it was only in my lifetime through the discovery of what is a number finally getting a definition. Believe it or not, this is in Wikipedia everywhere else, that we didn't have an explicit definition for the word number. Well, you should say linear number, and it was Conway, John Horton Conway, who just died a little over three years ago from the COVID virus. Well, we're coming up on the anniversary of his death, perhaps three years, perhaps four. But he was the man who finally got the definition of what is a linear number, fully. Uh, quite an accomplishment, because he went right around um, very, very great men, including Georg Cantor, Dedekind, Dedekind, and the von Neumann. Uh, there's just three emblematic names for a whole legacy about uh, the usefulness of numbers. Is has its own theory called number theory, with departments that just keep growing. Uh, that these did not exist 150 years ago, although it had already begun. <clears throat> so we're talking about geometry. Um, it's linear. All, all, in other words, you have heard of hyperbolic geometry, no doubt. There's basically, you could say, three kinds of geometry, but they're all linear. <laughs> it, but one of them is called hyperbolic. One of them is called elliptical, and that would be the closest to spherical. But they're all ba essentially based on um, what comes down to the calculus. And in fact, these objects have been transformed into 
well, not transform, but they're very commonly represented with complex numbers. Um, further, com well, complex numbers are called that for a reason. Now, what, what is peculiar about all that? All of that's a rather natural development in what's called the theory of numbers, oh, it helps to have some good theory of numbers, yes. Um, <clears throat> they are linear. <laughs> uh, linear numbers, yes. Well, that actually means what it says. Whenever you're talking about numbers, which is what we prefer to talk about now in astrophysics and quantum mechanics, is numbers, of course. Um, Where's the geometry? You know it has to be there. There's always a geometry for any number system. Now this is number system in the broadest sense, like an algebraic system. Remember, all the numbers that we've ever used, whatever they've been called, and you could probably name seven different kinds of numbers, beginning with rational and then you would end up with transcendental, but there's several classes of numbers, but they're all linear. One exception, or I should say the first exception, is complex numbers. And the reason for that is complex, but should be able to say it simply for a layman. That's my job. So what are complex numbers? They're two component numbers. That's revolutionary. There's a reason why complex numbers are such a fantastic tool. And the fundamental theory of algebra is now based on complex numbers, which are considered to be a superset of real numbers, which is saying a lot. It's a stretch to say that because of an imaginary component. Imaginary? Well, you have to be able to translate that back into linear algebra because that's not linear algebra. But you can treat it as if it were part of linear algebra by composing a special multiplication rule called conjugate multiplication, where you eliminate i. You have to before you can compute your result. Complex numbers are a shorthand. This has also been done at 3D with quaternion. This again uses an imaginary number, but it's a distributed imaginary number. Now what Einstein did was exactly the same trick. It's that word imaginary that you have to keep foremost in your mind. When you say complex numbers, you're saying imaginary in a two-component number, which is extremely significant, because spherical geometry that I discovered in 2022 is a two-component rational number system. You need a two-component number. In hindsight, it's easy to see that this fits a lot of keyholes. But part of the magic of spherical numbers is that they're very simple. They're two-component numbers very similar to imaginary numbers in that simple structural sense. The key difference is pretty obvious. Complex numbers have an imaginary component. It's not really imaginary on the number line, though. In other words, the construction of complex space, a 2D concept employing the concept of the imaginary number, which is simply the square root of negative 1, although you run into a, a certain problem when you do that. Well, the main problem, though, is obvious. It's now imaginary. I is not... Uh, it's, is it on the number line, though? No. No, it's not. It, not because of its value, computed or not, but because it's in a two-component number form. It's one of two components. But you see, it's not... You have to be specific now when you say component because each one of the components has a coefficient. The real part, it's a coefficient based on one, correct? But for the imaginary component, it's a coefficient based on the square root of negative one.
which induces what you have to capture. That has a that does something to what the number is. It's now a two component number, obviously, and obviously it has an imaginary component. What do those two facts add up to? You get a rotational function in the plane. I is a generator of a circular function. So in essence, you've reparameterized the circle which is a breakthrough of inestimable value because this is what I discovered is what we've been angling for all of these efforts to penetrate certain paradoxes like infinity, division by zero, and there are several other problems that accrue in linear algebra basically because of zero and infinity because these are now linear concepts which may not apply in real space. In other words, the inherent limitation of our number system is because it being based on a line, you have an inaccurate perception of infinity, an inaccurate portrayal, an inaccurate representation. You have an, a hole in your system at the middle called zero. And that turns out to be the puncturing of the infinitesimal zero punctures the infinitesimal and gets to the center of the universe. Actually, that has never been done in physics. We have never found the center of the proton. It breaks into a harmonic system, as I characterize it, called the three-quark harmonic. And nobody has been able to figure out exactly what's going on at the center of the atom. Because to know what is going on at the center of the atom, you have to know what's going on with the neutrons and protons, which are almost exactly the same particle, because they're composed of three mechanical parts, which only differ in a binary relationship between their, among their characteristics. But it's a 2-1, two, 1-2, one, one, two, split. That's what you get from the number three, is the ability to blink. It's the manifestation of the blink rate. I'm saying it that way to go out on a limb to challenge you because if you have picked up on where we're going on the definition of infinity, it is in a geometric two-part relationship. The outer infinity and the inner infinity are well understood structurally. They are related. What I discovered <clears throat> is the mathematic relationship between those two infinities. But it has far-reaching consequences because it's a simplifier. Because it generates real space. It doesn't generate grid space. It's a major difference because there's a number system attached to this. It's spherical space with a coherent number system that changes none of our mathematical concepts whatsoever. It actually simplifies the difficult portions of our number system. It gets rid of them. It gets rid of division by zero. It gets rid of the number zero. Because according to John Horton Conway's tree of the surreal numbers, when zero is split on day zero, it generates a binary tree. One of them goes to one, and the other one goes to the valent opposite on 180 degrees in linear conceptual space. That has to be unlearned, but we can't. It's written in stone now. But there's a better way. But for there to be a better way, to begin conceptualizing space, in other words, not with the line, you can't leave the linear numbers behind. They're computable because of the zero one machine logic that's locked on the line, that's a zero. It's linear. We use linear logic to think. That's not a curse. It's a blessing for the earth. With calculus, we can get anything we want and have.
and we'll get more. But that is the advantage of linear numbers on Earth. <clears throat> when you're trying to conceptualize the universe, the first thing a child learns, and we all must relearn it now, is that when you look out into the night sky, you're seeing a sphere. You're seeing from a spherical surface, you are using spherical vision, and you're looking at a sphere. It's an unbounded sphere. But everything you see is a circle, and those turn out to be spheres. Then you find out that the planet is rotating on its axis. That's the introduction of motion onto a spherical surface. And then you find out that the planets are going around the central sphere. That's the shell system of universal space at macro scale. It's remarkable that in our description of the atom, which we had thought might be the center, uh, not quite because it has a nucleus and the nucleus has things in it, actually two things, and those two things have a three thing inside them, and that's as far as we've gotten, we cannot isolate a quark. In the Hadron Collider, the quark cannot be isolated, but it can be analyzed. And it's the most important analysis we've ever made, but it, of course, leads to a conundrum. It leads to a paradox. We're trying to find the center of the space. If it's for the atom, then what's the center? We found it. It's the nucleus. Does the nucleus have a center? Kind of. It's distributed among protons that clump with neutrons. And they follow a very specific, you would have to say mathematical, pure, orderly form. But as for what it's, what's at the center of the atom, it's definitely not a zero. And so where our three lines meet produce a hole in the system that we cannot handle with either division or multiplication. So we're stuck with the line that we had in the Stone Age. That's all we've been using. But we're very clever with how we use that straight line. What we're facing now is the hole in it. It's okay to use a single straight line and say that zero is at the Archimedean balance point. That'll separate your index on a valence of 180 degrees and you get plus one and minus one separated by a distance of two. But that's all you get. It's a one component number and you're measuring space. You cannot measure time with that number. In order to measure time, you have to measure time space, which is a two component number. We call it light speed. That is a two component number, distance, divided by time. Albert Einstein said, you're now going to need to use that number. And Max Planck cracked it open, geometrically. In John Horton Conway's depiction of the birthdays of the numbers, the genius is the split on zero, which matches what we know, and the IEEE -E -E confirms it, is that zero is a split number. Every number after that is split it as well. It's a plus minus valence. And if you end up using an index for spatial separation, you will end up with a straight line with a 180 degree valence. But on day one is born the valent one. It's a one that has two aspects. One of them we say is negative. We're very comfortable with that. I want you to become very uncomfortable with that. I want you to think about it very deeply because of what I'm about to say next. Because what happens on day one of John Horton Conway's surreal number generation system is nothing short of miraculous. But it does not become apparent until you get to day two. And that is the day 
Let's actually look at it and see what happens on day two. You have a binary tree that's splitting, and the first split is two. The next split is two to the second power. There will be four tree branches now going up. You can throw away the entire negative side because it's going to end up being a mirror image of the positive numbers. So on day zero, the number zero is a two component number. And on day one, you have a two component one if you choose. You choose not to because you want the index of spatial separation, which is positive one. That means you can discard the negative numbers, you can't get rid of them, but it's like a ghost. You don't need to think about them any longer. We're defining what is a number. This is known to be true, so follow this carefully. When you get to day one, you now have decided to choose one as your index. And now the distance from zero to one is spatial separation on a straight line. Because of the valence, you chose for one. Now, consider that the entire definition of the number is balanced on zero. We have decided to choose one as the index and we're going to day two. But pause here for just a moment and consider where we are. The number one is the simplest number. But when you go to the next step, it follows the rule that John created. And so this is axiomatic. You're going to have to accept this on faith. But I can tell you, you'll be rewarded if you credit this axiomatic declaration. That on the next binary split, when, it, when the number 1, positive 1, plus 1, splits into two numbers, what are they? Try to guess. If you've seen the number tree for the surreal numbers, you probably can remember. One of them, obviously, one branch goes to two because on that line of branches will be one, two, three, four, five. But you see, it does split. And what does it split into besides two? It goes zero, zero to one, one. We choose the valence and take positive one just to get rid of the ghost of negatives. And then that splits into two and another number. What is that other number? Can you guess? It's reciprocal two. If two is two to the first power, this is two to the negative one power. And there's your negative back if you want it. It's in the exponent. One half is two to the negative one. What's interesting about the relationship between these two numbers, two and one half, is they form a single number if you want them to because they multiply to one. One and negative one on day one add to zero, but on day two, two and one half multiply to one, the root of a new tree. That's the root of multiplicative space. But it shouldn't be called that. That's in a previous lecture. Let me summarize it. You could also call it multiplicative divisional space, which would be more accurate, but it's not simple enough. It's proportional space. 1 over 2 is the opposite of 2 over 1. They're proportional numbers on unity. It's very important to say on unity because that's the lowest number. Except for the fractions. There are fractions less than one. One whole tree is the fractions. The other tree are whole numbers. One splits to two, the first whole number in multiplicative space, 
but it's a split number, the other part of it is one half. And that's proportional space, which is a spherical space. If you say that one is the surface of the sphere, then all of the fractions are inside and the whole numbers are outside and that is the definition of that tree branch on a new root on positive one. What I want to introduce you today to is the other side and this goes extremely deep but I'm going to make it simple. You can't get rid of the negative side but it's funny how it reappears. Day two is the birth of the quantum numbers, and you can think of that too as frequency, and that defines the whole tree to omega. Although we're going to come back to that because there is a finite limit to frequency. Frequency, by definition of universal space, cannot be infinite. And that means there is a, and it's quantized. So there is a top frequency that's finite. It's not infinite, but it's the last finite number. That last finite number is by definition rational in Planckian units. It's a whole number, a whole number frequency, because the smallest frequency is two. And that defines the inner limit of the universe in two aspects, and this will blow your mind. It has been blowing the minds of physicists for 70 to 100 years. So this will be a restatement of the paradox in a way that I am certain you have never heard it. The quantum numbers are reciprocal numbers in force space. Energy is the unit we're counting. Max Planck discovered that frequency equals energy in Planck units. And it has a lowest number. It's a quantum number, two. And now you know that two is a two component number. The question is, what is the two and what is the one half? this will end up being time-space. And there's a curve that describes this in spherical space called the Boscovich curve, which shows a right angle in spherical space where two particles collide. Because of the correct definition of the law of continuity, which solves for infinity as well as I've proved, you now know what happens when two particles collide. What happens to the velocity when it's transferred? That has been the question that's perplexed men for over 200 years. What happens when two particles collide? The Boscovich curve describes it perfectly. As you can imagine, it's not linear. And that is the understatement of the year. It is, however, a coherent mathematical relationship in spherical geometry with a number system that fully represents it. The strange thing about this two-component number system, although it's simply multiplicative space, it's given to us and we are blueprinted to see this. We do recognize spherical numbers. They're spherical shells from one, a surface of one, the fractions less than one go in towards the center and never reach it, to the proportion that the whole counting number is going out. Remember, these are Planckian units, so it's two, three, four, five, six. The numbers going in are inverse two, three, four, five, six. And they make one number, they all multiply to one. Here's the, bo here's the brain bender. Max Planck stated and proved that two times one half equals light speed. And that changes the basis of our number system. It changes our metric over 
to space-time based on an orthogonality that I discovered in spherical space that allows Einstein's orthogonalization of space with time to come true in real space. It's the orthogonality of two components of natural spherical space. But when I say natural, it's rotating. There's no sphere in the universe that's not rotating. And that is the theorization of my discovery in a nutshell. We now have a number system capable of expressing Boscovician force mechanics. Everything in the universe is in motion and we've never used it because we've never even conceived of the possibility of a two-component number because a two-component number, as complex numbers prove, give you the ability to put a circular function in your linear system. But when you do it with an imaginary number, you get what you pay for. When you do it the way the universe does it, they're rational numbers that multiply to one. Two, one-half is a rational two-component number because it internally multiplies to a sphere. It multiplies to light speed. All the shells represent light speed. Not completely, though. Because it's split, the shells going out are simply one part of the number. There is a reciprocal number that is going the equivalent of in but it's not 180 degree valence because there's nothing inside the sphere. I proved that with the bootstrap theorem, which I should recount right now. This would be the right time. Let's do it. To get spherical space using the Euclidean approach, you begin with what's called the antipodal theorem and we'll go through it quickly without explanation unless I deem it necessary to interject something quickly. But get ready for the ride of your life if you haven't heard this, and twiddle your thumbs if you already have. No, no. I go through this willingly as many times as it comes up in context. I'm willing to go through this sequence because I am not kidding you. I learn something every time. You begin with a straight line, where are you drawing it? Empty your mind and look at the night sky with me in a Gedanken experiment. You're 10 years old, 12 years old, or 35 years old. It doesn't matter. It's a starry night, and you and I are looking into the night sky together. Only I'm not there. You have to be alone. But you can do this. We've done it. Now, you're not under the night sky, but you can re empty space. Empty it out of matter. Empty it out of anything vibrating. There's no electromagnetic rate. It's a blackboard in your mind. And now draw a line. What does it do? It goes to two infinities, correct? The number two is all you need to get out of that. Erase the line. Now, why did it go to two infinities? Draw the line again. It goes to two infinities. How do you know that? It's because there's a center. And we know that now, but we're just... This is axiomatic, so you got to go out on a, a limb a little bit. Not too far. But it does have a center. Now erase the line again. We now have a center that we did not have on an empty blackboard. What's it the center of? Draw the line one more time. Now we have the center and one other thing, unless you say it's two other things. But I told you the number two is the key. What you have is a diameter of a sphere. And the reason you can say that is at the Archimedean balance point of the line, where it hits two whatevers, there's a center point you can rotate the line. And the two infinities stay the same. Nothing changes except orientation. You just defined a sphere.
so it's natural to us, is all that that proves. That is the antipodal theorem. Now we are going to use that for the bootstrap theorem to create the universe from scratch geometrically. The ancients would have liked to have done this, but you and I are simply going to do it. We have a center and we have an edge. And now we're going to assign two numbers, one to the edge and one to the center. And we're going to give these numbers a name. One of the numbers is the number one because it's the simplest number. But also, as you and I now know, because it's the base of one of John Horton Conway's trees of numbers and because it's unity and because it's the multiplicative divisional proportional identity, which is not zero, that's for the line. This is the sphere, and one is for the sphere. Zero is for the line, but for the sphere, it's multiplicative divisional proportional space, not additive space because there are two operators, add and proportion. When we do proportion, we draw a line and put a number on top and a number on the bottom. That is a two-component number. It's called a fraction. But if you invert it, like say it's one over two, if you turn it upside down, it's the number two. But you should say, to be complete, it's two in proportion to one. It's two in relation to unity. The one half is also in relation to unity to the same proportion. What proportion? Multiplicative. Those two numbers multiply to one. That means you can say that the two is outside of the shell and the one half is inside the shell. And that will be consistent all the way to the edge and all the way to the center and it generates a realization that one is the smallest whole number right we always knew that but now we have to say something else there is no zero there's no zero at the center of this system That has profound implications, but we're now going to complete the knot. And this should blow your mind if it hasn't already. Get ready for hyperwarp drive. The number at the edge is infinity over 1. It is outside the system by definition. Infinity is imaginary. We're saying so. And the number at the center is 1 over infinity. And this is the infinitesimal of spherical space, the natural pseudo number. This is the definition of imaginary space and the only definition of imaginary space. We were hitting it with darts, but this is to catch the fish. This is the only imaginary space. It's two things. It's the center of any spherical space, including the universe itself. And the edge is pure imaginary number. You'll never use it, you'll never touch it, you can't. It bounds the system. And that's where infinity belongs, as the guardian. And this is multiplicative inverse space on unity. And that defines Universal geometry. This is space-time. I'm going to prove that to you. But in order to do so, that sphere has to rotate. And that's where the fractional numbers go. One half. Does it go to one third or does it go dyadically on a binary? We know the numbers going out are whole counting numbers. Frequency, can it go from two to three? Or does it go from 2 to 4? 
We're at a different scale. We have never measured a two-frequency wave because that would be half the size of the universe, probably. Frequency two? There's no such thing, okay? Well, there is. Max Planck said so. There is a lowest frequency. Now, whether we've actually detected it or not is a completely different thing. But mathematically, he got it right. That means the smallest wavelength is measurable in Planck units. It'll be some number over 2 because it's at the center of a linear measuring system. So it'll be divided by 2. And that's the inner limit of the universe in quantum mechanics. There is no zero anywhere. The zero cannot be reached, and that's part of the problem. You can't ever reach the center of a quantum system. There, in effect, is none. But we know there is a geometric center, so this is a paradox. We don't like paradoxes. We want to actually know what this paradox means. In other words, solve the knot. This is the quantum paradox, but it does have to do with infinity. It has to do with the infinitesimal, the center of the system. If you use a zero, you have three lines meeting at an impossible angle. There's no such thing as as an orthogonal relationship between two straight lines in the natural universe. Where those two lines meet as they approach zero, it quantizes into a spheric relationship. There is no zero, and that's profound. What there is, is unity on light speed. We know that. Light speed is the only number we've ever measured to absolute precision, and that is written in stone by the decree of man, but I agree with it. You might as well standardize it, since you're never going to use the time unit anyway. We have to now. We couldn't without a two-component number, because in the ultimate orthogonalization represented by two and one-half, that's a, essentially a 90-degree angle. It's not 180. It's not plus-minus valent. It's multiplicative valent. And that turns out to be orthogonal on a spheric surface. That's the rotating sphere. On the ring on the sphere, which is unique to a rotating sphere, it holds the angular momentum component. That's the energy component because it's motion. And now we bring in Ruger Josip Boschkovich, who has the algebraic definition of what I just said. It's a force curve in force mechanics. And that's the end of the Hamiltonian. And that's the end of the Lagrangian. And a lot more of the temple is about to fall. Don't think it's going to fall. Everything that we've discovered using our linear number system is a valid derivative solution at enormous cost. The calculus is incalculable. The Einstein field equation is completely impenetrable to a human mind that's not absolutely dedicated to understanding it over a long haul. But it can be done. And the same thing can be done with a Dirac equation. But when you finally get down to where you might be able to crack the nut, you have to have a tool that's not in your tool belt yet but you might suspect I'm about to give it to you so you can have it forever. You need to have spherical geometry ready at hand in quantum mechanics. For when you get to the limit that we call a paradox, you switch. You have to switch. Your complex numbers won't do it. Your calculus won't do it. They're based on linear zero. You need the two-component number system in spherical space, but you also have to know that it's a dynamic system. One of the numbers 
is a different data type than we've ever used in the history of mathematics or physics. We know of it is called time. But now we need to have it in the number system just as friendly and peaceful as if it had always been there. And that one is light speed. Max Planck proved that light speed is the correct unitization of the number system. I found it in geometric space and it defines the relationship between add which is locked to the line and multiply which is locked to the sphere. These are two different identity numbers. Zero for additive space and the identity for multiplicative space is one. We need to switch. That is a two component number. It's one over one times one over one. And that is the inner surface of the universe. And now I'm going to show you as we go down through a double rabbit hole that I've only told you half the story. There is an aspect to the universe that we have not addressed directly yet and that is the original question. What are we going to do about our inability to see the edge of the universe? How are we going to rationalize the edge? I just gave you part of the answer because there's a geometry you have to take heed of. The edge has two layers. And this has to do with a bifurcated definition of infinity. Physical infinity is infinity over one in pure geometric space. And that bounds the entire universe. But it gives it a distributed center. Those will be the protons, for lack of a better word, the center of the atom, whatever that ends up being. But it's not a zero. It's a number. It's the reciprocal of the edge number. Neither number can be reached for exactly the same reason. It's the law of mathematics. When you start with one on the surface of a sphere, your numbers do not have zero in it. Zero is a pure derivative number because our linear number system is the calculus derivative of the spherical number system. And that is a separate profundity because it eliminates calculus except for one step. We still have to do the same thing that they had to do with complex numbers. You have to have a way to get the linear numbers out because they're the computable numbers. We have to be able to feed these numbers back to our computers. So they have to be linear. So you have to take a derivative as the last step. But in, that is much preferable. It's a simple derivative to get the linear numbers out of spherical space. They're in there. They're in a two-component system. All the numbers multiply to one, but the components change, and that's the relationship between time and space. The sphere is rotating. That's the energy component. The space component are the spherical shells. We see it in the atom. The Boschkovich curve describes the structure of the atom perfectly. It's a curve that describes the orbital shells of the electrons all the way to the center and a variation of it which I pointed out on behalf of Ruger. He also discovered the proton-proton relationship that is called the strong force. His curve also describes that. All of these are right angles in spherical space. All of those shells are at right angles to a force law. A strange thing to have to say, but it's this force law that controls orthogonality in real space. The quantum you could say it's been discovered, but remember this is still a number system. The wavelength of two, the 
lowest wavelength possible, a wavelength of one half, I should say, frequency two. You see, there is nothing between two and three. And there's nothing between three and four. These constitute spherical shells. The whole counting numbers going out, the way the universe uses numbers, Max Planck showed us that those are rational numbers in our linear system. We need to use our linear numbers in proportion to each other, and then they work. If you begin on day two with a two-component number of two and one-half, you can quantize the universe in energy units. It These are rather large numbers, one would have to say, because that's an extremely small distance. The distance of one wavelength that's the smallest wavelength in the universe is approximately 10 to the negative 34th power. There are computations that go to numbers smaller than that, but they're all reaching a limit. They never go to zero. That's the nature of the quantum. In order to have continuity in linear space, you can't. In order to get the continuity that we now know is the law, according to the Boschkovich force mechanical law, which is a perfect algebraic curve, if you switch to energy numbers, you're going to have to have a two-component number because energy is motion. It has time in it. Space does not have time in it. But one does not occur without the other. Einstein essentially proved that, but he proved more. They're orthogonal. They're orthogonal on this two one half relationship. This has to do with how the sine wave is, is decomposed, but there is an orthogonality in there uh, that hasn't gone completely fully noticed because it only becomes apparent in spherical number space that the two and the one half are not like the one and negative one. The one and negative one are separated linearly on a 180 degree orientation in linear space. But the two and one half are orthogonal in spherical space. It looks orthogonal to us as well. But the sphere is a curved surface. So where two particles actually collide and you get to see how this flexes. How is velocity transferred? Is it transferred in a jump as linear mathematics would have to, it were forced to predict? It jumps at infinity. Or it jumps, it jumps, finally. When does it jump? Well, according to the Boschkovichian force curve, where it jumps is that a place that only can be described geometrically because it's a transfer from one system, one data type, a spatial data type, and it changes over to the time domain. And that is the orthogonality on the Boschkovichian curve. All of his curves for the electron orbital shell and finally for the first shell after the nucleus that's a jump from the surface of the nucleus, which would be 1 in this geometry. It's a jump to whatever is 2, with nothing in between. That's the weird thing. There's no space in between is one thing you might say, but it can be measured. So there's something there. There always is. But it's um, obviously very tiny, but it's always there. So now the original question that was asked 200 years ago, just to give a ballpark figure, and has never f finally been answered, is what happens when two particles collide? When does the velocity get transferred, and is it in a jump or is it continuous? It is continuous. There is no jump in the collision. But it's paradoxical to say so. So, what is happening is somehow beyond our ken, but we're so close to seeing it 
the, the mathematics of quantum electrodynamics is some of the most amazingly accurate predictive mathematics that's ever been formulated. Richard Feynman was correct to point that out. It is extremely accurate. We're seeing something. But Richard was also brave enough, and I give him full credit, although it's a little bit pessimistic. He's just being realistic when he says it's safe to say that no one will ever understand it. Why does he say that? It's actually extraordinarily difficult to say why you, he can get away with saying that. But you see, we can't accept that. It, it has to be understood. And what is it we're trying to understand? It's this, this transition between two domains. We only measure and see and compute linear separation because we're constrained to linear numbers. But when you use linear numbers, the way the universe shows us how, as proportional quantities, then you're fulfilling the whole meaning of multiplicative proportional space. Because now it's spherical. It's just as natural as that. If you see the line, you want to measure linear separation, well, good luck with trigonometry, and when you get to curve space, you're going to need calculus. And even in order to model it, as Einstein had to do with some valid geometry, it's going to be inside-out space. It's hyperbolic. You don't want that. You don't want the calculus either. What you do want is to see what's really happening. Can our numbers help us? Yeah. They actually show the way. Because infinity is such a difficult problem to solve, to see it solved with such a simple step that you proportionalize it to get rid of the infinitesimal and get rid of infinity and put them outside the system, so now your multiplicative divisional proportional space has no division by zero, Max Planck comes along and says, you can use whole counting numbers for frequency for the energy component. Now all you need to do is rotate the sphere, and you've got it. The energy component. This is time. I will close the lecture with that. We're coming up on an hour. Time is not space. But time occurs whenever and wherever there is space. And space occurs wherever there is time but they are orthogonal to each other in pure geometric visual space. They somehow relate at a spherical right angle that's smooth. And in that energy, motion, time, data type, we have the secret of something. But at least we now can compute it. Time space, two component spherical space. You can see the numbers going out. You can see the numbers going along the ring. That's the angular momentum. Linear space cannot reach that. Albert Einstein said, you're going to have to now. Time is part of space. We'll be back with an explanation for that. We're going to go into some metaphysics. It'll get spooky, but I promise to show you the ghost numbers. I want to give you a teaser as we're coming up on one hour. In the next lecture, I'll show you that we have composed dynamic spherical space for universal space as an ideal geometric model that gets rid of infinity and it gets rid of zero. We're now using... Rational numbers in reciprocal relation, they can perfectly describe light speed. And it defines the quantum shell structure and ties in perfectly with the Boscovichian force curve mechanics, which replaces the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian. And we're done with complex numbers. We're done with calculus except for a simple derivative and no more division by zero. And we have the definition of infinity now. It's the dual number that bounds universal space. 
We'll be right back. This is Anna Galactic bringing you the secrets of the universe. I never thought it would go this far, but Allah is merciful. Is he not? I'm in. Stay tuned.